Okay, this is going to be uh, part two of chapter 11, the cardiovascular system. And this is going to essentially be the blood. All right, so in this section, I told you in the previous section, we're going to talk about leukocytes and white blood cells. There are two types based upon the staining. And what staining is, is, is most of these cells are, are translucent. So unless we stain them, we can't see them on a slide. And there are granulocytes, abundant stain granules. Granulocytes mean they have granules. And agranulocytes, which means they have very few stain granules. Two types. A clinical note, and this is going back to the end of part one, which was ABO blood typing and hemolytic disease of the newborn. <clears throat> Genes that control blood type come from both parents, and this is both mom and dad, uh, occurs in an Rh negative mother with an Rh positive child. Uh, does not occur, usually occur from the first from the first child. Mother is sensitized, so they build antibodies, and usually occurs during the second. Now, let's. Let's kind of talk about this here for a second. So I'm going to blank the screen. All right, so you have mom and dad. All right, and mom is RH negative, and dad is RH positive. So example of this, mom could be A negative and dad could be O positive. Their child, let's say that the child is O. And just so happens to be positive. Now here comes the problem. The positive, now the first child will sensitize mom and mom will make antibodies for RH positive because her immune system will kind of say, okay, that's a foreign invader. We cannot have positive and negative blood types mixing. So what essentially will occur is, is that mom is now sensitized and ready to essentially initiate a fight next time she sees RH positive blood. Well, second child comes along and let's say that the second child was AB positive or A positive So, mom, dad, child, first, second, first child was O positive, dad's positive, mom is negative. A negative, O positive. Second child was A positive. All right, after the first one, mom became sensitized. So now whenever second child comes along, mom essentially attacks it like it's a foreign pathogen. So she may lose the child in the first trimester or if she does carry the child to term, there is a possibility that baby's blood and mom's blood will mix during birth. This could cause a hemolytic reaction in both the mom and the new child. So hemolytic disease of the newborn generally occurs during the second one and it's because of the RH factor. 
uh, testing for blood compatibility, they essentially do a cross type, a cross match and type. Uh, typing is just off of the ABO, they figure out what blood type you are. And cross match is a, a blood test, a mixing drops of the blood with solutions that have anti A and anti B example. The patient that clumps when exposed to anti A and anti B is AB. If no reaction occurs, then the person is zero. If the opposite reaction occurs, then they're the opposite of what? Example, if you have anti-A and then put A in there, it's going to clump. If you have anti-B and put B in there, it's going to clump. So this is the cross match. Uh, the presence of RH negative is also noted, of RH if it's negative or positive. Clinical note, blood transfusion reactions. Great care is taken to assure correct typing. Hemolytic reactions can occur, and this would be devastating to somebody that's already in a traumatic event. White blood cell circulation and movement. They are compatible, they are capable of amoeboid movement, which means they essentially move uh, from a wave-like fashion, gliding movement of flow from cytoplasm into cylinder cellular processes extending from the cell. They migrate out of the bloodstream by squeezing through the epithelial cells called diapetus. Uh, one of the things we're going to learn in the vascular chapter is that the capillaries have can facilitate this very easily. They are essentially flaps of skin and the white blood cells can move in and out of the capillary beds very easily. Uh, attracted to specific chemical stimulation, positive chemostaxis. Uh, so anything that we see in the immune system that would excite macrophagic action or phagocytic action, which means eating action, uh, would essentially excite and bring the white blood cells to them. Uh, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes are capable of phagocytosis, or eating is what that means. Types of white blood cells, there are neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. And these are all of them. And if we'll just note here, this is figure 11.8 in your book. Neutrophils are the ones that have the multiple nucleuses. Eosinophils, are, they stain essentially red. Basophils stain essentially blue. A monocyte has a, they're, they're bigger, one. And two, they have a gigantic nucleus. This is the nucleus on the monocyte. And then a lymphocyte, which is not much bigger. They're, they're kind of small. They're not much bigger than a, white bl a red blood cell in size. And they have, they're mostly nucleus and very little cytoplasm. Uh, neutrophils, first uh, white blood cell to arrive at the injury site, very phagocytic, which means it's very, it likes to eat everything it comes into contact with. And essentially what we get is if you have something, buddy, that has a purulent discharge or a pussy discharge, uh, this is from dead neutrophils that tried to eat or consume the pathogen and didn't quite get the job done. So they kind of fall to the wayside and they act like dead soldiers. Um, this is what actually generates and makes pus. Uh, examples of this is going to be um, if you have a zit on your face. The part that you're squeezing out is dead neutrophils. Eosinophils. Named dark, uh, named due to the dark staining in red and their granular appearance, eosinophil red. Uh, coated with antibodies, uh, primary mode of attack is exocytosis, which means they essentially spit out toxic compounds onto the pathogen, and they're mostly seen in parasitic infections. A basophil, named due to the staining dark blue and granular appearance, migrate to sites of injury and discharge granules into the interstitial fluid and the granules contain chemicals and they can essentially contain heparin and histamine and what we don't want the pathogen to do is to start running through a system of vessels. So what histamine, do, histamine does is it causes vasodilation and this keeps it from having uh, essentially a pressurized system. Now this also gets us into problems whenever we have anaphylaxis because whenever these basophils uh, and the immune response releases histamine on a very large scale, 
it can cause massive vasodilation. So anaphylactic shock is due to the histamine reaction. Heparin is to pretty much prevent blood clotting. We don't want to give it a nice little space where it can uh, flourish. We want to keep it out in the open so that the antibodies and the white blood cells can get to it. Uh, monocytes, twice the size of a typical erythrocyte. Aggressive phagocytes, which means they aggressively try to devour things and eat things, uh, attempt to devour things larger than themselves. Monocyte, uh, chemical signaling attracts neutrophils, monocytes, and other phagocytes and draw fibroblasts to the region. And essentially, this is to uh, ring the dinner bell, if you will. Uh, anything that's phagocytic is going to hear that dinner bell and come uh, and come to the area hungry, essentially. Lymphocytes, uh, slightly larger than a red blood cell, relatively large nucleus surrounded by a thin halo of cytoplasm. They migrate from the bloodstream to peripheral tissues and back to the bloodstream again. And this is done through diabetes as well. Uh, they can secrete antibodies, which is awesome, which means that you can easily incite an antibody antigen reaction from uh, the cell. Differential count and changes in white blood cell abundance. A differential count. Now, at times, whenever they run a CBC, they'll do something called a manual cell count. And what this is, is to look for a left shift or right shift CBC. A differential count, manual cell count, to assess maturity of the white blood cells and type of infection. Normal ranges on the white blood cells are 6,000 to 9,000. Um, normal average on those is about 7,000. And a left shift CBC is whenever they stain them and they start looking at these white blood cells and they see a lot of bands. So the bands say that the, your body is kicking out immature white blood cells to fight something that may be out of its, out of its league or out of its caliber. The right shift CBC, high monocyte and lymphocyte count, are generally viral in nature. So just by looking at a manual cell count, they can tell if it's an actual virus or if it's a bad bacteria that has pretty much beat up your immune system. There's some more terms down at the bottom. Leukopenia is a low white blood cell count. Leukocytosis is a high white blood cell count. And leukemia, white blood cell counts greater than 100,000. Uh, what happens is, though, is the leukemia cells aren't very good. Um, they die off very quickly, so you'll spike out a lot of white blood cells. It'll kind of clog things up and do some damage, and then in the same token, the next day, you may have a white cell count of two with leukemia. Uh, segs and bands, and this goes back to the left shift or the right shift CBC. How they tell the difference between them is these are considered segmented. So we have segmented nucleuses in this cell. Same way with here. There they are. And then these right here are immature. These are considered a band because all of the nucleuses are banded together. So this is an immature white blood cell. If we saw a bunch of these, we would think that the patient's immune system is getting beat up. So segs and bands. White blood cell formation. Hemocytoblasts, which makes lymphoid stem cells, and this goes back to our figure that we were looking at, to where it starts off um, as one cell and then it becomes more specialized. Lymphoid stem cells, which make lymphocytes. Myeloid stem cells, which give us the variations, and the variations are going to be basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, and monocytes. And all of these are white blood cells. Lymphoid stem cells migrate from the bone marrow to the lymphoid tissues. Uh, the lymphoid tissues are going to be the thymus, spleen, and the lymph nodes. Lymphocytes are also produced in these tissues. White blood cell formation. Various hormones are involved in the specific development of white blood cells. White blood cells other than lymphocytes are regulated by hormones called colony stimulating factors, or CSF. Thymosins produced by the thymus pr provide differentiation of lymphocytes. And we're going to learn about this more in the immune chapter. But the differentiation is they essentially make T cells for us. Thymosins and the thymus make T cells, another endocrine organ. 
uh, platelets, uh, blood, banking, blood banking and transfusion we're going to talk about here. Platelets are pretty much cell fragments, uh, membrane enclosed cytoplasm, and they essentially house clotting factors. Uh, thrombocytes, nucleated platelets, non-human, may refer to humans in some cases. So if you hear thrombocytosis or thrombocytopenia, this is going to be referring to the platelets. Now they do use that term synonymously in medicine. Um, megakaryocytes, large nucleated bone marrow cells, they continuously shed cytoplasm. These cytoplasm packets become platelets in the human body. Thrombocytopenia is a low platelet count, and thrombocytosis is a high platelet count, can exceed 1 million. And the problem with that is, is that you will clot at anything if you have too many platelets. The problem with thrombocytopenia is, is that you don't have enough clotting factor to survive someone punching you in the arm. So again, thrombocytopenia, low platelet count, thrombocytosis, high platelet count. Clinical note on blood banking and transfusions. Red blood cells live about 120 days. We've talked about that in part one. Plasma contains albumin, fibrogen, and other clotting factors. And cryoprecipitate uh, contains clotting factors, so we can actually skim this off of another person if they donate blood and give the patient just the clotting factors if they're out. Uh, remove from the plasma by freezing and slowly thawing used in bleeding disorders. And uh, an example of this would be uh, someone with hemophilia may actually get something called cryoprecipitate. Uh, platelets, also called thrombocytes, aid clotting process by adhering to the sides of the vessels and they provide uh, structural support whenever we're trying to build a clot. Um, <clears throat> white blood cells used in non-responsive infection and the help on this by infusing somebody with uh, someone else's white blood cells is kind of unclear. Plasma derivatives, and this is going to be specific factors of the clotting factor, uh, factor 8, factor 9, 10, and so on. Autologous, uh, blood donor and recipient are the same person and this is like a preoperative donation. So if you knew you were having a big surgery and you knew you might possibly need some blood, um, if you knew this long enough or far enough ahead of time, you could actually donate your own blood and then that would be the best match, would be your own blood. And then we have allogenic, blood transfused to someone other than the donor. And that's what most of blood typing and the blood bank is is allogenic. Um, the, you, someone else donates the blood, it's put into an area and then it, as it's needed it's utilized and to get the appropriate blood the person would have to be cross-type and matched. <clears throat> hemostasis. Uh, in hemostasis we're going to talk about the clotting process, aspirin, clot retraction and removal, heparin and fibrinolytic therapy, abnormal hemostasis, fibrinolytic area, the area of reperfusion, and we are pretty much out of that era at this point, but we'll talk about it here a little bit at the end. Hemostasis, and hemostasis pretty much means blood clotting or the process that halts bleeding prevents the loss of blood. Uh, phase one um, of hemostasis is the vessel walls and the endothelium contract this is a smooth muscle fibers, and this is considered a vascular spasm, and phase one is also considered the vascular phase. So if you lacerate the vessel very easily, the, the smooth muscle and the fibers kind of spasm up, and it decreases the lumen on the vessel so that less amounts of blood is traveling through it. Phase two, platelets begin to attach to the endothelial surfaces. Uh, platelet phase, also known as the platelet plug in phase two. <clears throat> and then phase three. Coagulation phase, complex sequence of steps that lead to circulating fibrinogen into a clot of fibrin. The clotting process. The clotting process can occur without clotting factors, calcium, and 11 different proteins convert inactive proenzymes into active enzymes. <coughs> clotting factors are factors in the body of enzymatic action that assist in the clotting process. <coughs> and this is figure 1110 in your book. 
And what we see here is essentially we see platelets. We see fiber network, which is this is where fibrinogen comes into play. Is it makes this fiber network that's through here. And we see trapped red blood cells. So it uses this entire <coughs> pardon me. It uses this entire area as pretty much a platelet plug until it can uh, actually repair the tissue that's damaged. Um, so we have two different pathways here, but they all form something called the common pathway. And the common pathway is essentially prothrombin to thrombin and then the fibrogen, fibrinogen to fibrin makes a uh, thrombin fibrin polymer that essentially assists this plug in working. So an intrinsic pathway is done by the platelets. Intrinsic is platelets. And an extrinsic pathway is facilitated by tissue damage. Still, we form calcium, clotting factor, factor X is activated. Whenever factor X is activated, or factor 10, we form the common pathway. Prothrombinase, which makes prothrombin, which leads to thrombin, and this is the actual clot, which fibrinogen then forms fibrin. And this would be considered the mortar. And the platelets would essentially be the emergency patch. So again, intrinsic pathway is facilitated by the platelets. Extrinsic pathway is facilitated by the tissues. They both form the common pathway thrombin. If we would think of this whole process as bricks, mortar, and emergency patches, if we're trying to plug a hole and we want a long-term hole, we essentially need bricks, which is the thrombin. We need the mortar, which is the fibrin. And we essentially need emergency patches, which are platelets. These together create this, which is a platelet thrombin fibrin polymer. Clinical note, and this is aspirin. Aspirin inhibits aggregation of platelets. Now, what that means is, is that it stops the platelets from sticking together. We're going to see that aspirin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory whenever we get to pharmacology, and it works off a property called thromboxin A2. Now, why that's important is because this is in our inflammation pathway, our inflammation cascade. So it produces by it is produced by activating platelets that have prothrombotic properties. It stimulates activation of new platelets as well as it incre increases platelet aggregation. And this is thromboxin A2. This is what it does. And aspirin pretty much blocks this from occurring. This is achieved by mediating expression of the glycoprotein 2B3A in the cell membrane platelets. Circulating fibrinogen binds these receptors on adjacent platelets, further strengthening the clot. Thromboxin A2 is generated from prostaglandulin H2 by thromboxane A synthesis. Aspirin irreversibly inhibits platelet cyclooxygenase 1, preventing the formation of prostaglandulin H2 and therefore thromboxin A2. So whenever we look at this, prostaglandulin H2, 
thromboxin A2. This is what aspirin does. Now, why that's important? This whole pathway formation that we see in here is inflammation. But in that same pathway, we see clotting occurring or the ability to clot because this would be a stimulation of I just had an injury and I need inflammation there to bring more cells to repair and I probably have some bleeding so I'll activate thromboxin A2 to slow down the bleeding so I don't bleed to death. The same pathway is what we fight if someone's having a heart attack. We don't want those platelets sticking and making the clot bigger because that's going to decrease the size of the lumen even more or the size of the pipe. So we attack this and we attack this by giving them aspirin and aspirin essentially makes the platelets less sticky. Intrinsic, extrinsic and intrinsic in the common pathways. The extrinsic pathway begins with the release of lipoprotein called tissue factor by damage in the thelial cells or tissues. So again, extrinsic got started by the tissues. Intrinsic pathways begins with the activation of proenzymes exposed to collagen fibers at the injury site. This is going to get started by platelets. The common pathway, whether it be extrinsic or in intrinsic, pathway activate factor X, forming prothrombase, converting to prothrombin, and then to thrombin. Prothrombin is a prephase of thrombin. Thrombin activates fibrinogen to fibrin. Calcium in the extrinsic and intrins intrinsic pathways re required calcium to form the common path pathway. Vitamin K is also important. Adequate amounts are necessary for the liver to synthesize four of the clotting factors. Most of our stuff, an uh, example of this heparin, would adjust the ability of your, your body to clot by adjusting the amount of vitamin K in your body. Clot retraction and removal. Uh, clot retraction, once fibrin network has appeared, platelets and red blood cells stick to fibrin strands. Platelets contract and bring the wound together. Fibrinolysis is pretty much dissolving of the clot. Plasminogen, um, perform, perf, preform of plasmin and plasmin protein. Now, what this is, is this is the ability to break down the clot. <laughs> Whenever you form plasmin, any time that you would form plasmin, the clot will actually break down or dissolve. This is what all of our thrombolytics or our clot busting agents are based on, is the formation of plasmin. Tissue plasminogen activator, released by damaged tissue, activates plasminogen. Plasmin digests the fibrin stand, strands and breaks down the clot. And that means if we actually put plasminogen into this, this whole clot would essentially dissolve or bust. Again, extrinsic pathway by the tissue, intrinsic pathway pretty much by the platelets. Common pathway, prothrombin to thrombin fibrinogen to fibrin, platelet, fibrin, thrombus, polymer. Clinical note, heparin and fibrinolytic therapy. Fibrinolytic therapy, things like streptokinase, t tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, pretty much dissolve the clot. Anticoagulant therapy, Coumadin and heparin, inhibits the formation of the clot. Antiplatelet therapy, inhibit platelet aggregation. So examples of this would be aspirin, Plavix, are two antiplatelet therapy drugs. Uh, anticoagulant would be things like Coumadin and heparin, which would adjust the formation of thrombin. 
and then fibrinolytic therapy would essentially bust the clot. Uh, we use it currently on strokes. Clinical notes, abnormal hemostasis, uh, excessive coagulation, clots form in the circulation rather than the injury site. Um, people that would have too much clotting factor would easily form clots, which could be problematic. It could give them PEs or clog up vessels that would filter the blood. Examples would be the liver or the kidneys. Inadequate coagulation, hemophilia, inadequate production of clotting factor. Now what this would do is at the first time that you got hit or bruised, this could cause a lethal um, bleeding in your body or a lethal hypovolemic event. Clinical note, fibrinolytic therapy and the area of reperfusion. Now what we used to do before there were so many cath labs was essentially anybody that was having ACS or acute coronary syndromes or chest pain and they were having an active MI, uh, formation of a clot in the coronary artery is what ACS means. So they would actually have a clot in an artery that is perfusing their heart. Now, they, what they used to do is they used to initiate clot busters that would essentially dissolve that clot and reperfuse that section of myocardium acute ischemic stroke, formation of a clot in the cerebral arteries, and we still do this. So if we have an acute onset of stroke and it's less than three hours, and we can trace back an accurate time, we may be able to clot bust and reperfuse someone's brain. Uh, another term, DVT, deep vein thrombosis, um, thrombosis in large veins of the body. Now the problem with this is, is as the veins uh, get closer to the heart, they get bigger. So if you have a deep vein thrombosis in your leg and it breaks free, it's probably going to travel through your heart and into your lungs. Uh, that is called a PE and it can be very deadly. Peripheral arterial occlusion occludes arteries to the tissues. Now this will cause an asphyxiated limb or a limb that has no uh, pulse or oxygenated blood to it. As far as terms to know, they should be pretty pretty easy. Uh, blood, and that would be the two percentages, the plasma and the actual formed elements. Cardiovascular system, which is the heart and the vessels. Coagulation, common pathway, we just got through talking about it. Embolus, which would be a clot that probably formed in your leg and moved to your lungs, that would be an embolus. Erythrocyte, red blood cell, fibrin, uh, the actual mortar or the thing that holds the clot together, fibrinolysis, the busting down of the clot, hemocrit, which is a percentage of the formed elements, and 99.9% .9 of those are red blood cells, hemoglobin, iron-carrying uh, protein in the actual red blood cell that allows us to carry oxygen and CO2, Hemopoiesis, which is the formation of red blood cells. Hemostasis, the ability to stop bleeding. Leukocyte, white blood cell. Plasma, about 50% of the actual blood sample. Platelets. Um, megakaryocytes make them. They're exocytosis from the megakaryocyte. They carry clotting factors. Uh, so that you can provide emergency patches throughout the body, and then serum, which is essentially the plasma. If you have any questions over Part 2, feel free to contact me. Name is Roy Smith, 405-219-7613, or you can drop me an email at smithr.msa.net. Thank you.